Pro tip number three, turn your clicker on. So 2011, I finally got up the courage to give my first talk. And honestly, I stank. I was terrible. But a funny thing happened. I had people thank me for sharing the talk that I gave. I had people tell me to my face that, you know, with a straight face, that I did a good job. And even though I was certain that I was the worst speaker in speaker history. But it took a while for it to sink in, but I learned a valuable lesson about the power of community. See, there are people out there who are really awesome at being human. People who will look past your mistakes, they will see the good and the potential that is in you, and they will encourage you to not give up. Because when you do hard stuff, like get up and share your story with other people, everyone benefits. And I hope every day I'm a little more like one of those kinds of people that's encouraging others to step out and be awesome. And here's one of my favorite quotes. When I gave my first talk, people didn't remember how I fumbled around with some, you know, global ASAX problem or, you know, some whatever the dot net thing I was doing at the time, it was it was bad whatever it was. But they remember me and they remember that in, even in some small way, I help them, either with you know some tip of knowledge that they didn't already know, or you know help them with their career, or help you know encourage them to if they saw me speaking, they could probably say, "Hey, I could do that too." Last year, or I guess it's 2016 is no longer considered last year, but 2016. I had the privilege of giving a keynote at Music City Code in Nashville, Tennessee, and I shared the same story about how I got started. And I used to live in Nashville, so it was really awesome to be able to speak to a lot of folks that in my own home, you know, hometown that I knew. I had more than one person come up to me afterwards and said, "I remember when you gave your first talk." And you're right. You're t you were terrible. So, oh, I believe that public speaking is a sweet skill that anyone can learn. And if I can do this, a painfully shy introvert, I know you can do this too. And you're thinking, yes, I am an introvert. I've taken the personality tests to prove it. And they, you know, and I've taken them more than once and they always tell me the same thing. I have no introvert in me, or extrovert in me. And you might be thinking, well, what's this, this slice up here? Don't you have a little bit of extrovert that gives you the ability to get up and speak in front of an audience? No, I always believe in giving 10% <laughs> more. You know, 110%. There, there is no extrovert in me. So this is all a show just for you. So what I've learned about being an introvert is it's about where you draw your energy. It's a part of your personality. It's not something you can change. However, shyness is a behavior and it's something that we can change. Jeremy Bite, well, I call him Jeremy Bites because that's his Twitter handle. Jeremy Clark has a fantastic talk that he gives on becoming a social developer. And it's all about breaking out of your bubble and actually you know, talking to other developers at, at events like conferences and, and meetups. So important. Because geeks you know, love to talk. Once you get started, you can't shut up about whatever it is that you geek out about. It's starting the conversation that's hard. I submit to you that there are three inevitable things in life. Death, taxes, and PowerPoint. 
Sooner or later, it's going to happen. Whether it's speaking to your team, at your company, maybe a wedding or a meetup, or even a conference like this, you're going to have to stand up in front of a group of people and present some information. And you might be thinking, I can understand about being asked or voluntold or volunteered to speak, but why would I want to speak on my own volition? So let me tell you, having someone not only understand the message that you want to deliver, but give them that aha moment and inspire them to actually go and do that thing that you're talking about is one of the most rare and precious rewards that I have ever experienced. Public speaking opens up lots and lots of doors of opportunity. You can, if, if you let public speaking become something that you do, it can give you opportunities to travel the country or even the world. Make new friends, maybe lead to some job opportunities, or you may become an influential person, or you will become an influential person in your workplace and your community. You might not think of yourself as a leader, but by public speaking kind of automatically makes you a leader. Because if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. So said President Mutton Chops. Now, if you're going to be a speaker, you need to know that there are certain things an audience expects of you. First of all, they want to be entertained. No one likes to suffer through a boring talk, right? No one, um, no one wants to feel like they're being sold to, right? You, you, as a developer, you know when you're getting a sales pitch. And you know when someone generally cares about the audience and about the topic that they're talking about. And out of those two things, an audience doesn't want a speaker to be wasting their time. They expect a speaker to be well prepared, to have done their research, and have a clear, well thought out message. And obviously, an audience wants to learn. Sometimes they have very specific needs and goals that they come to your talk expecting to receive. But most of all, they want your insights. What are the secrets that you're learning on your journey? And just like you're here to learn the secrets about public speaking from me. So here's what I'm going to do. Each time you see this symbol on the corner of the screen, I'm about to tell you something that I believe is really important. Something I've learned the hard way that will be of great value to you. So the first secret I want to give you is you don't have to be an expert to be a speaker. This is, this is so important because there's this thing called imposter syndrome that you may have heard about. And I believe it's one of the biggest reasons why people don't speak. The struggle is real. It's this idea that your ideas are your knowledge is insignificant or unworthy, that someone will think you're a fraud, that you're just not an authority. Um, you just feel insignificant or you know, not worthy of, of being the person up in front of an audience. So let me tell you, I've been all over and I've met and had conversations with so many speakers. This is universal. This is something that we all struggle with. Every speaker that you see at CodeMash, and I keep bumping into this thing, sorry, which is another thing I should not do. Um, they, they will tell you that they struggle with this too. I mean, even, even to this day, it's like, do I really know my stuff or is somebody going to call me out? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard. So I think the, the best antidote for imposter syndrome is the fact that you have something that no one else in the entire world has. And that is your experience. People can argue semantics, best practices, or whatever all day long, but they can't argue with your experience. 
And here are some essential ingredients to giving a good talk. This is another thing that will help you to be the best speaker that you can be. So the first is why. What was your motivation for getting into what you're talking about? What, what's your story? What problems were you trying to solve? And what are the reasons, your reasons and problems may resonate with other folks in your audience. And your personal story is what hooks people in and makes the, a talk interesting. Next is what? The features and the highlights and the capabilities, the benefits. What are the things that are, that are part of what you're talking about? This helps to fill in some gaps for your audience to help convince them to go do whatever it is that you're talking about. And it's your opportunity to really geek out about whatever your topic is. You know, really figure out all that stuff. Next is to tell more about your story. How did you use this technology? Or how did you get started? Or, you know, what is it that, that you started doing and that you learned along the way? What are the issues that you faced along the way? Including, what mistakes did you make? What? You want me to admit mistakes? You know, I've already suffered from imposter syndrome and you want me to, you know, tell people that I'm a fraud? Well, it's, it seems counterintuitive, but this actually adds to your credibility. I don't know about you, but I make mistakes all the time. I want to hear, as you know, when I go to someone's talk, I want to hear real people doing real work and solving real problems that I can relate to. So what would you do differently if you were to do all this stuff again, you know, as part of your talk? You can turn your mistakes into key takeaways that your audience will, will, will love to hear about. And then finally, give your audience information that they will put them on the fast track. So where do I go to get started? Including your contact information and some other things, you know, you want to fill that out. Local meetups are a great way to get started. Something within, you know, driving distance. Uh, organizers of these local thing, you know, types of events are more than happy to give you the opportunity to speak. It's a great way to get started. Expectations are pretty low, you know. We all have a story to tell. And I bet if you really thought about it, you could come up with three or four ideas, things that you've done, things that you're interested in. What is it that you geek out about? Chances are someone would like to hear about that too. And if you're still afraid to share your ideas, remember that someone once said in a meeting, hey, let's make a movie with tornadoes full of sharks. <laughs> it's not that hard. I mean, the, the, the bar is set really low on what you can do to, to entertain your audience. And speaking of entertainment, here is my next pro tip. Entertainment is a superpower. Getting the audience to laugh is huge. It boosts your confidence as a speaker, helps you to relax, and it gets your audience more engaged. And it may provide some relief after all the other dull talks that they've been going to. Uh, start with a joke. That's what I try to do, is start with some personal story. Usually, you know... Um, something that I messed up doing or whatever, uh, something that's happened to you, it's a great way to get you know, everybody a little bit more comfortable with what you're talking about. As an example, uh, a couple of years ago, I submitted to, to this conference and I got selected to speak. And I got the email saying that you know, one of my talks had been selected for this conference and I went, running into my living room and, and, you know, told my wife, I said, honey, I've been selected to speak at JS Comp in Uruguay. And she says, where's Uruguay? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's in Europe somewhere. Turns out it's not in Europe. It's down in South America 
and they don't speak English, which is probably a couple of things I should have checked into before submitting to a conference. But I had a fantastic time. It was really, really awesome. And I owe it all to public speaking that I got to make a, an adventure like that. It was so, so awesome. Laughter is a superpower, and storytelling is extremely effective. Visual storytelling, however, is a secret weapon. What I'm talking about here is you doing some of what I do, and that is using hand-drawn illustrations to tell your story. It's entertaining, it's unique, it's engaging. Bullet points and clip art and stock photos will never tell your story like you can with your own illustrations. I went to Arthur Dorler's talk, excellent talk, on how our brains learn. And this was just spot on. Your, your, our brains love to be surprised. And your hand-drawn illustrations are brain candy. Your audience will eat it up. I guarantee it. But you might be thinking, I can't draw Mr. Neal. That's great for you. But I can't do what you do. I don't even have a beard. <laughs> well, I tell you that yes, you can draw. And you can buy a beard on Amazon or something if you need to. Now, if you can draw shapes, and I'm sure you can, and if you can draw some lines and some arrows, I bet you can do that. If you can draw blobs and you can draw some letters and numbers, you put all these things together and it's amazing what you're capable of expressing. It's, you can express something far more effectively than you think you can. So, just using, you can start with stick figures. This is how I got started. I just crude stick figure drawings. That's all it takes. And if you take some of those shapes, you can, exp you can start to draw all kinds of interesting things, like a city or a bicycle. Now, these are just circles, lines, and a triangle. Now, is that the most accurate, most realistic bicycle you've ever seen? No. But you instantly knew what that was when it came up on the screen. It doesn't have to be perfect or beautiful. It can be as craptastic as you can possibly imagine, and your audience will still love it. Now, just using a blob, you can draw the most popular thing in programming right now, the cloud. <laughs> or the second most popular thing, a pile of JavaScript. <laughs> now, you remember going to school and taking notes, there's something about writing out notes that helps you to remember. It's the physical act of writing that stuff down. It helps you to visualize the, the information. And when you go back and look at those notes again later, you can remember all kinds of information surrounding the notes that you took, right? Well, drawing your own slides does exactly the same kind of thing. It helps you to remember what you want to talk about. When I first gave, when I gave my first talk with illustrations, I was like amazed that each time a slide would come up, I could instantly remember all the things that I wanted to talk about. I no longer needed notes for the most part. I still rely on notes quite a bit. But as I'm drawing something, I'll be thinking about all the things that I want to say and it makes it so much easier and so much more natural to talk about it when that slide comes up. Now if you're still unconvinced that you can draw and that you can and the effectiveness of using hand-drawn illustrations, go get this book, Show and Tell by Dan Rome, and even better, go watch uh, on YouTube, show and just search for Show and Tell Dan Rome on YouTube and there's a there's a talk that he gave at Google. It's about 40 minutes long. I watched this thing like five times in a row. The first, and, and that's what started me on this journey of using hand-drawn illustrations. And it's just, it's just amazing. The power of visual uh, communication is extremely powerful. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the things you can do 
when you uh, when you create a talk. I like to create, you know, uh, as I'm thinking about something that I want to talk about, I'll create a road map of, of the talk that I want to give, you know, an outline or whatever. I want to make sure that you have some key takeaways. What are the what is what are key takeaways that you want your audience to know, or what is the one primary key takeaway that you want your audience to walk away with? And center your content and your story around those takeaways and create a roadmap. And if you want, share this roadmap with your audience early on in your talk to say, these are the things we're going to cover, and this is you know kind of the traje trajectory of the talk that we're going to give. And that kind of gives them a mental picture of where we are in pro progress of the talk that you're giving. Is there a clever theme that you can weave through your talk? Is there a storyline? Um, one of the things you can do is start off with a, a story that ends with a little bit of a cliffhanger. Don't give them the whole story. And then make them wait until the very end to bring up the, you know, the resolve of that story. This is something that comedians do all the time and is very, very effective. But don't you wish that sometimes you could just fast forward and be done with the hard stuff? I wish that were true. If you can, find someone or a group of someones to give you feedback and to help you fine-tune your presentation. This is something that I really wish I had done when, when I got speaking. I had some folks that were encouraging me to do it, but I was too shy and too uh, you know, self-conscious or whatever to say, hey, this is the talk that I've come up with. Could you give me some feedback on making it better? When you get selected to speak, that's when you know the stuff has hit the fan. And it's your opportunity, as I said before, it's time for you to geek out and really dive into your research, come up with an outline, take a bunch of notes, get your stuff organized, and don't forget to put your slides and notes, demos, whatever it is that you come up with, into, into a safe place. Have a backup of that stuff. I've, I've heard horror stories of speakers who put in hours and hours of effort and then lose it all. So have a backup or use source control just like you would with a programming project. There is no substitute for practice. I'm sorry to say, but practice as much and as much as you can. Um, even some, you know, talk to some stuffed animals or, you know, your, your kids at home, they'll love it. Yeah. You can rehearse your timings. Like if you use PowerPoint, there's a way to go through your slides and it will tell you how much time you spend on each of your slide, each of your slides, and how much time you spent on on it overall. And you want to make sure that you're getting in, you know, to some reasonable amount of time. Practicing helps you to work through difficult phrases um, and to rehearse the transitions between your slides. Maybe as you start to practice your talk, it's like, wow, that didn't really go like I expected. I, you know, moving from that slide to the next slide felt really awkward. How do I, I need to figure out, you know, what it is I need to do differently. And it also helps you to come up with a plan if you start to run out of time. Because you can know what, you kind of come up with some ideas on, or some strategies as to, you know, if I'm going too fast or going too slow. I know it's kind of cliche, but this is a really a pro tip. Record yourself. I know it's so painful to hear your own voice outside of your head, but this will help you to improve tremendously. This was, this was one of the key things that helped me to become a better speaker. Um, early on in, when I was speaking, I got myself a little handheld recorder, and when I went to give a talk at a, at a meetup or something, I would set it up on the podium in front of me and record myself. And then on my way to the next conference or the next meetup, I would endure the pain of listening to myself give that talk, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I said that phrase like 50 times. I gotta stop saying that. Or whatever it is. You know, it's it will help you to figure out better ways of delivering your message. Video is great too, if you can ask somebody to record yourself with a video, and that's even more horrifying. Make yourself a checklist of all the things that you need and preparation and things you need to do 
print it out and take it with you when you go to give your talk. There are a couple of really good checklists in the uh, resources that I'll point you to in the end. Some, some, some things you might not have even thought of, like checking your fly. Turn off your notifications. This is, uh, I've seen this happen so many times where something awkward really, you know, appears up on the screen while someone is giving a talk. And it's one of my coworker's pet peeves. He goes bananas when somebody's notifications aren't turned off. Every speaker gets nervous just before their talk. I mean, so the, the, the length of nervousness gets shorter as you get more experience, but you always get nervous. Uh, you know, there's a famous thing about Peter Fonda throwing up backstage when he's in the 70s. Like, every speaker and performer gets nervous. Um, it's just when you first start out, your nervousness starts about three months ahead of time. Um, so, some strategies to help with this is to, one is to warm up the room. It's, it's to get out, you know, once you have everything set up, and you got your technical bugs worked out, you go and talk to some, some unsuspecting folks in your audience. Uh, pick a few victims in the front row or whatever and go say, hey, how's it going? What's, how's the conference or whatever? What, what is it that you do? What's, what's your profession? It not only helps you to warm up your voice, but it helps you to get some of those jitters out. You've already made, you know, uh, a friend or two that now you can, you know, make eye contact with them or, you know, during your talk. It helps you to know that you have some allies in your audience. That you're not just talking to a bunch of strangers, that you got a couple of friends that you have who've got your back. Just start. And once you start, you go into autopilot. This is where your preparation and your rehearsing and your practicing is going to pay off. Because once you start, you're going to wake up on the other end of your talk and go, what just happened? Did I make it out okay? I blacked out there. The more preparation you do, the more practice you have, the better you're going to be at all that stuff that goes by in a blur. Because things can go wrong. What are some things that can go wrong? Well, you can have a death grip on the podium. Or you could walk around too fast, up and down, you know. You could speak in a monotone voice. You could speak too fast. You could not know what to do with your hands. Uh, you might say uhs and ums and all those kind of, you know, classic mis mistakes. And sometimes words just come out wrong, no matter how hard you try. But here's, here's the secret, okay? Get this, your audience, especially in a conference like this, is very forgiving. They want you to succeed, and they are cheering for you. Most of all, you know from going to other talks, you, you can filter out all that kind of stuff. You're just there for the content. You want to learn. So you don't, you know, the kind of idiosyncrasies and you know, things that people do, you're not, you're not worried about that. That doesn't distract too much. So they're here to hear to, for your message and to learn. They're getting your, getting your message across is far more important than trying to solve these things. And I still make these classic mistakes. You'll get better with practice. And the, and I've learned that the more I act like a fool, the better I, the better results I get. And, you know, and if I make mistakes, then it helps people to know that, hey, this guy's been doing a lot of speaking and he still makes mistakes. Maybe I can do this too. Another one of my pro tips, just a personal pet peeve of mine, is to never apologize, which I, I broke my own rule earlier when I bumped the screen. But this is something that I, I, I think is important. Um, there's psychology to this. So if you if something goes wrong on, a, on your slide or you you make a mistake, most of the time your audience doesn't know that you made a mistake, right? Uh, if you just keep going, uh, they'll know, never know the difference because they weren't there when you practiced, right? 
Um, so if you apologize and say, I'm sorry I meant to do this, or I'm sorry for the demo, you could just laugh it off or move on or make some joke about it. If you apologize, it kind of sets the wrong tone. You know, it kind of, it's, it's a mental thing. It's kind of like your audience will, will think, think it, it does weird things psycho psychologically. So just try not to, try not to do that. Try to find other ways to move on or move beyond a, a mistake that you make. It'll go better. Another thing is enthusiasm. This is something that I have really struggled with. Uh, w when I was first getting started in public speaking at the user group that I would go to, one of the things we did was we'd have a speaker survey. And this is what you had to do. You had to fill this out in order to get entered into whatever giveaways were being given away that night. You know, if you wanted to win a copy of uh, what was it? Windows Vista. I, w I won a copy of Windows Vista one, one time. Like, wow, that's so exciting. Um, so <laughs> I give one of my talks at this meetup, and I get these surveys back, and there was a survey uh, filled out by a young lady, and she says it was a great talk, good content, but lacked enthusiasm. And that's like saying you need to change your face. You know, because this is my excited face. This is my worried face. This is my, you know, uh, you know I, I, I have a hard time acting like I'm excited. So, as a, you know, what I've learned for my own self is to fake it till you make it. You know, I start out a lot of my talks with, I am so excited to be here. And it's a lie. But but it works. It, it really works. You know, to share what I've learned about, and I'm just so excited about collecting paper clips or whatever it is I'm geeking out about, and uh, it actually works. So the, the bigger your audience is, the bigger that you need to be. Now there's this guy that I used to work with that for the for years before we worked together, I was just in awe of his speaking ability. I mean. If I went to a conference, I would go to one of his talks even though I cared nothing about what he was talking about. I just love the guy's ability to in engage his audience and, and speak. I finally, I finally put my finger on it about a year ago. And the reason I like this guy so much is because he, was, he is, when he gets up in front of an audience, a real-life cartoon character. He, he's just so expressive. He's just so animated. You know, he'll do things like, yeah, last night I was working on my demos, and I was, you know, and he's just, he, he's just so entertaining to watch. I can't do that. But, um, you know, maybe that's something you could be a little, you know, being a little bit exaggerated on things will, will help to be uh, entertaining. So, a note about demos, you know, we're at a technical conference, so chances are if you're going to be doing public speaking, uh, many of you are probably going to talk about, you know, something, some kind of technology. So here's my advice to you. There's this thing called Google, and there's another one called Stack Overflow. It's easy for someone to discover how to do something, and your audience is way more interested in why. Why should I go learn this technology? If you convince them why, they will go and they'll, they'll learn how to get started. So if you have a demo, and I'm saying you, you may not even want to have a demo, you can show some, show some screenshots of it in action or, you, or show a video clip. Um, my recommendation is, unless you're showing an IDE, uh, features of an IDE like IntelliSense, do not live code. It's just bad things are just waiting to happen. So your focus, if you have a demo, your focus should be on enforcing the why. I'm showing this demo because this technology is so cool or this technology makes, makes this problem so much easier to solve uh, than the old technology that's out there. You know, reinforce the why of your talk. Don't, don't tell them how. 
unless that is specifically, you know, some training that you're doing where you're actually, you know, the purpose of the training is to show them how to do it, right? Here are some thoughts that I have on questions and answers. In a conference setting, when you're finished, you know, a lot of times you see a speaker say, are there any questions? Um, my opinion is that you should end your, your, your talk and give your audience the permission to leave. Give them the option of whether they want to stay and, you know, ask questions or get out early and go, you know, take a bio break or get a snack or whatever it is. I've seen too many times where an audience is held hostage by one person who is just adamant about getting, you know, their problem solved. Um, that has, you know, almost zero relevant, rele relevance to everyone else in the audience. So at the end of my talks, I invite people to come up and talk to me and ask me questions. I give my contact information, all those kinds of things um, to get feedback, which I absolutely love. I love questions. I love feedback. I just don't want to hold the entire audience hostage, you know, while somebody else uh, gets what they need. So this is for an audience like this. Now, if you're, you know, giving a talk at a meetup or giving a talk in a conference room with, with, with your team, sure, you're going to want to ask questions. You may even, you know, want to let your audience know that they can ask questions throughout the talk that you give. Hosting an open space like it like you have here at CodeMash is an excellent way to continue the conversation of the talk that you give. So as an alternative to um, answering questions at the end of a talk, you say anybody who's interested in talking more about this, you know, schedule an open space immediately after the talk that you give and say, come meet me over in, you know, space A and we'll we'll geek out some more. You can ask all the questions you want. Give your contact info on the final slide, or better yet, a shortened a shortened URL um, that has all your slides and your demos and links to books and websites and resources, articles, everything. Put it all in, in one, one link. Like I, what I usually do is set up a GitHub repo uh, with my slides and you know all the links and contact information in the readme of that repo, and that's what I point people to at the end of the talk. When your talk is over, decompress. Don't forget to follow up on any of the questions that you promised you would do, like, um, you, know, you know, somebody asks you a question and you don't know the answer. You can say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll help you find that answer and you can follow up with them later, get their contact information or have them ask them to contact you and promise to follow up. Um, listen to your recordings, as painful as they are. I want to give you one final secret, and this one is, is a gift. And if there's one thing that I want you to remember, it's what I'm about to tell you. We are the only creatures on this planet, capable of understanding good, mercy, and forgiveness, and grace, your words are extremely powerful. Your words have the power to destroy or to breathe life. And you have this amazing ability and privilege to speak life into those around you. Your family, your coworkers, Strangers that you meet at a conference like this, like it or not, we are relational beings. And we are designed to live in community. People will know you by the way that you love one another. So whether you're standing on a stage, or sitting at a conference table, or sitting around a dinner table with friends and family, I believe that you have an incredible opportunity to impact the people around you. So go be courageous. Go inspire others. Go and be awesome. Thank you.